uh, will put us in a bit of a back foot from a time point of view. I'd like to invite the presenters to just come up front and we'll shoot off to the questions from the floor and from online. Suffice to say that whilst they're coming to the front, that um, uh, it's, it's uh, to be welcome that there's an atlas of offshore uh, world that uh, most of the developing countries will be looking forward to, especially for asset classes, you can come through. Uh, especially for asset classes that uh, are not financial necessarily, uh, including real estate. So I think most developing countries would want to have sight of that information. Uh, Niels, you can join. Um, Dario, and whilst you prepare your, your, your questions, I think it's also important, um, Niels, that uh, at some point we, we do understand what the implication of uh, the voluntary disclosure programs becomes on the 10 billion rents gap that we see uh, because I think there, there, there could be some blind sighting if you are not able to see what voluntary disclosure programs were effected in the same period uh, and how that plays into the return information because the, inf the assessed information is better than the return information in as far as any intervening uh, disclosure programs that could have been run in 2017, 2018. So I think it's important to bring that into the gap, but I'm sure South African colleagues on the floor would uh, ask questions. I'm open for, for questions from the floor. There's a roving mic, and we will interchange for two questions we take on the floor. We will take one online, and you'll indicate if you've got one. Hi, thank you for the fascinating presentations. I have two questions. Uh, one is for Niels. You showed us this black line of foreign reports and this gray line of domestic uh, reports. And um, you said now you hope that the gray line will go up. My initial expectation was that the black line might come down as tax advisors do their job and people get around the CRS. So isn't the fact that the black line stays up already amazing news for South African revenue uh, collection and the result in itself. And the second question is to Angela, you talked about this process of how um, information exchange got better and better from kind of a rough start. Um, do you think that's a, um, a useful way going forward to kind of start uh, with something and then improve upon it? Uh, there are other initiatives such as the EU uh, tax haven blacklists, for example, which are kind of wasting a lot of political um, momentum by just you know making one list less uh, salient than the next and so forth. So you can also lose uh, political uh, momentum when you kind of have to go through all these stages before you have the, the system you wanted from the start. So do you think it's a, it's a valuable way for other initiatives to approach like, to uh, proceed like that? Maybe let's take the second question and then we can um, yeah. allow the members to respond. Thank you. Uh, I agree with uh, Jakob for great presentations. I uh, really enjoyed all of them. I have a question for Annette, maybe a bit of a provocative question. It's a, an awesome paper, but I, I want to dig a bit deeper on the policy conclusion that we need to extend the CRS to real estate. I see the point for the Norwegian case where you have a wealth tax. I think the case would be much harder to make to, for example, a German politician, a country without a wealth tax. I think they would tell me, well, you know, we can't tax the real estate in Dubai anyway, so why put that on effort on them? If they rent it out and have income from them, the income ends up in a bank account, and we see that in the CRS. So do you think there's really a worldwide case for having making this effort to increase include real estate in this year as. Thank you. Um, maybe let me allow Annette to take that question from Dominica first and then I'll turn to Nils. Uh, thank you, Dominica. I think um, your starting point is that I, I agree that the reason why the good Germans should have that, there are two reasons, like transparency is good, like you don't know who owns assets in any case, we have many reasons beyond taxes, beyond the wealth tax, but there is also the income to get, income tax, and you're basically assuming that that CRS would capture that income tax, that it would go to a bank account in Dubai or something, like it's... Um, Things are a bit more complicated than that, and CRS doesn't work if you have it. Like there are ways to get around that with different holding companies and different structures. So, I think the German uh, Minister of Finance should be very interested in having this information. So, so the question, I guess, from Jakob was like, so I showed you a black line indicating uh, kind of the aggregate assets owned by South Africans reported by foreign banks, and it was kind of like 
decreasing slightly, but but more or less uh, constant over. Also, like the income, or like this, or it's like slightly decreasing, but but more or less constant. And so, I guess there are a number of different interpretations. So, so I guess you're right that this means that uh, assets have not, you know, gone into crypto or real estate or like other things that are kind of outside the scope of the CRS to the extent where income is just uh, plummeting. But it, it, I guess it also means that people have not moved, uh, which would maybe be even more desirable, have not moved their their assets back to South Africa to the extent where like the income is is now like accruing to South Africans account that would be easier to to monitor, I guess. Um, so I mean, I, I think it's not an explicit goal of the CRS to induce repatriation. Like it's fine if people keep their assets abroad as long as they can now be, be taxed. But I guess it's it's still easier for compliance purposes if people would repatriate their assets into the domestic realm. But I guess like, so I guess the, the answer to your question is that it's a little bit ambiguous what that uh, what that means and how, how good news it is that uh, that income has not gone down uh, <laughs> offshore. Thank you, uh, Jacob, for the question. Uh, I think uh, I will uh, respond the first with analogy. Uh, uh, you know, before you learn how to jump on one foot uh, or run, you, you have to learn how to walk. And, um, and I think that's uh, very true for uh, daily life as well as for implementation of complex uh, technical projects. Uh, the reality is we would not have had a UI uh, without having put in place mechanisms for implementation of a UIR first. You cannot have carve a cap and capture cryptocurrency assets before we went through the stage of a UI to start with. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's always uh, pays uh, to, to put foundations first and then improve it. Uh, obviously, when you speak, speak about big ideas, it's good to imagine the end result uh, and, and it's important to appreciate technical difficulties and complexities and um, bringing it closer to the exchange of information, appreciate all sorts of assets and all sorts of behaviors and all sorts of uh, avoidance or evasion strategies that you can use in order to avoid the existing framework. It's important to have that in sight. Uh, but also equally important is to make step-by-step uh, step progress. Otherwise, as we, we could see, you can leave some behind, some countries behind, because not everyone can uh, adjust to the same high speed. Otherwise, you can do something in the wrong way, because as you implement the basics, you also learn from that. So yes, uh, answer to your question, I do believe in the gradual process. I do believe that we should go through certain stages uh, before we can get to complete uh, what would be regarded as a, an ideal uh, uh, scope of, of exchanges um, of information as such. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take another round of questions by show of hands. There's uh, two hands. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. My question goes to Dario uh, and the uh, question of uh, tax amnesty in uh, Argentina. I was wondering, seeing as the effect was biggest after 2016, if uh, uh, the Panama Papers leaks was controlled for, and also the effect afterwards, seeing as, I mean, there has been many leaks, but that has maybe been the first big global one, if I'm not uh, mistaken. I was just wondering if it was accounted for. Thank you, I think the question is clear. There's another hand. Thank you so much um, for the wonderful presentations. Um, I'm just wondering, is there a possibility that um, um, some of the funds in offshore accounts have already been taxed? And then uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the CR, uh, CRS forms. If, um, if you get exchange the information and then you compare with your PIT forms, um, assuming there's no TIN, does it mean then you automatic, or oh, tax identifier, does it mean you automatically are prompting uh, registration or it could be that uh, probably the other jurisdiction missed the TIN, the taxpayer identification? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dario, first. Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, certainly the Panama Papers were leaked in May 2016. The amnesty began in June 2016, right? Uh, so in the paper we try to, we don't take a stand, a strong, strong stand on the amnesty being the, the, the main driver or the miracle of the reason why people disclose assets. We believe it's, you know, a big, uh, 
factor. We try to argue that there is a combination of policies and I think the main takeaway is probably that is that today in 2023 there is like momentum to kind of implement these amnesties uh, in a good way and try to take advantage of the information exchange agreements and that you know inf information is flowing uh, across countries. We believe that Panama Paper probably, you know, I know in Argentina, you know, people were freaking out at that point, uh, but there are many factors that uh, could explain. And I think it's interesting to see that all these disclosures are quite stable after 2016, right? And uh, that, that kind of suggests that it's not only the, the Panama Paper itself. Thank you, Nilsson. Uh, could those assets be already taxed? Yes, Interesting so question. I, I, I guess the question was whether like this, so we are comparing kind of people's self-reported income to the bank reported income in South Africa. Uh, and I guess the question is whether like like this income could have been taxed in a different jurisdiction. So that could, there could have been a withholding tax either where the securities are held or there could be people who really like have a, like multiple residences, for example, maybe they live half the year, year in London, the other half a year in, in South Africa. And um, I, I, I think you're right that some of these questions um, are important. Um, I, I think, and I should double check this, I think what we've done is that we have conditioned in our sample on people being kind of fully uh, taxable in South Africa, meaning that you know even if you pay withholding taxes abroad, you still have to kind of typically, and I think this is true for South Africa too, you still have to report your full foreign income and then you will get like a tax credit for the, for the, withhold, for the withholding tax you paid abroad. Uh, so that would be the typical case for someone who's fully resident in, uh, in South Africa. That said, I think yeah, there, it's probably also true that there are other cases where you know, you, people really like, uh, like have many residences, especially like very wealthy people and it can be complicated to to like keep track of so where the income is is really like and ultimately taxable and that can reflect you know something real that people really live in many different places but also you know the phenomenon that, that dominica has uh, has um, documented that people also strategically can choose you know like to have a, a, a second you know uh, account or a second address so that this year's report is sent to that uh, to that other jurisdiction I think like these these questions about residents uh, are are super complicated, and I don't think we pretend that we kind of fully fully uh, yeah, under understand it really in the data. Was that an answer? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll take one or two questions. We've got two minutes. There's a hand at the back. Hi. So my question is for Dario, and uh, I'm wondering, you know, you you you're sort of framing the thing uh, like uh, the the amnesty was was successful um and comparing it to previous amnesties that were less successful but i'm wondering if you have sort of a finer sense of when the reports were coming in and in the sense that it seems like what was really different was that uh there was a credible threat that you were going to get caught and in that sense so if if all of this wealth had come back anyways, regardless of the amnesty, then the amnesty just becomes like a way of, you know, relieving you really of the tax burden uh, that you would have had to face anyway. So uh, do you have any sense of distinguishing between those two effects or the effect of the amnesty itself versus the effect of the credible threat that you're going to get caught? Yeah. Uh, maybe let me take an online question. I, th I think you did try to answer that it's a combination of factors, but I'll give you a chance to come back online. Yes, so there are two questions. Um, one relates to wealth tax and tax and offshore wealth in relation to real estates. Um, someone is asking how this affects uh, public-private partnerships in terms of the advantages and disadvantages. And also the second question, has to do with um, the fact that ring, ring fencing worked for revenue accrued from tax amnesty. However, some developing countries are still hesitant to ring fence revenues. How do we convince them? Okay, we may need to settle back uh, to the first question, uh, but Dario, maybe you can respond to the yes, question. Yes, uh, thank you, Giacomo. You know, a, a statistic that it speaks for itself is, you know, like almost 4% of GDP uh, of the disclosed wealth were real estate properties. 
And, you know, that's not captured by these uh, CRS uh, agreements, right? The, by the CRS, but uh, so that suggests that it's, it's, it's more than the threat of detection. Um, yeah, I guess that, uh, for example, in the, in the Amnesty before 2016, there was also a Swiss leaks and it was in the newspapers in Argentina and yet, you know, you look at the time series and nothing happens. So I think it's a combination of factors. That, that's what we try to argue in the paper. So we think that, you know, 21% of GDP is not only because of the, the threat of detection. So it's, it's more than that. So it's an opportunity to come forward and, yeah, in a, in a safe way. I'm not sure that the online questions are clear. Annette, do you want to give a sense of it? Um, yeah, as I will give a more general answer to the, the why do we need more information on real estate offshore? Because it's not like, so building on what Dominica said. Like, why do you want to know that if you don't have a wealth tax at home? Um, so, so this is going back to the, the opening session today. Like, it's not just about taxes. It's about secrecy and trust and legitimacy of the government and if some people are able to hide their assets or ill-gotten gain from a home can if you can make hidden uh, agreements you can enable corruption if you don't know what people own you can't even hold them accountable for their hidden assets so if they exploit their government or their power but it also is um, important to to say that well like when the when the journalist investigated the Dubai papers, like who owned the properties or Iranak, there were so many criminal, known uh, criminals or like people who were convicted for tax fraud in Denmark, in Norway, people going bankrupt, hiding money from their creditors. And so they, uh, they, it's kind of, it's basically unfair that people, and some people can get away from their responsibilities by m shifting assets abroad to a country that does not have any extradition. Like for instance, there's no ex extradition agreement with Norway. So if you get to Dubai, you can, as a criminal, you can just hide there and live happy days with your ill-gotten gains. So for me, that's super unfair, basically. Sure, I think uh, in view of time, uh, suffice to say that uh, we over our time. I think it's important that we step back, um, Angela gave us a sense that maybe it's a paradox, uh, maybe it's not so hidden after all, if we leverage the power of, uh, of information and information exchange, but more so that uh, we create capacity to be able to consume that information and empower tax administrations to be able to act uh, globally, um, especially in the developing uh, countries on that information that becomes available. I think, again, I take a view on um, the differentiation between those countries that have got the wealth tax and those that don't have. But I think I accept the final uh, summation to say uh, for trust um, to continue to increase and the social contract to strengthen, it's important that uh, citizens start to get a sense that these hidden assets uh, are being exposed and the transparency is increasing and the tax administration and governments are taking action uh, to deal with this. With that said, um, thank you very much uh, for participating to our presenters and for yourselves for attending. The session is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.